I hear you say that life is hard. It is heavy and painful. It has left you slumped over with your head in your hands in resignation. But I am not here to tell you that you are wrong. Life is hard. But your heart is not weak. It is plump and it is juicy. It beats despite life's pain. It never gives in to despair. It is searching for something. Our hearts fight so one day they can be filled with love. This is our madness. We want love more than life itself. And yes, there is always some madness in love. But there is always some reason in madness. And when I look at life, I do not see despair. I see the butterflies and gazelles dancing with joy. I see these light, pretty, lively spirits dancing freely. They are conquerors of the heaviness. Their joy moves me to tears. And I could only know a god that could dance. Because when I saw my devil, he was heavy, serious, and brooding. He is the spirit of gravity. Through him, everything falls. So then, my friends, it is not with hate, but with laughter did we conquer. <laughs> Let you and I conquer the spirit of gravity together. And we were born for this war. My first battle was when I learned to stand. Soon I could run. Now I fly with my own wings. Now I am like an angel. Now I soar above the world. Now I look down upon what I once was. And I see that a god dances within me. Thus spake Zarathustra. There are many lies told about Nietzsche's life in order to discredit him. We are told that he was weak, pathetic, and sickly, and due to this horrific state, he became resentful, and he spent his life fantasizing about transforming into a school bully, and beating down everybody who has a compassionate heart. So all his prophecies and theories were nothing more than cope. And to make this worse, he had syphilis, which was rotting out his brain. In the end, he is a frail, sickly man that you should ignore. So what we will do today is we will inspect the truth and the lies surrounding Friedrich Nietzsche, the German incel who lived on a mountain and wrote books that hurt your feelings. From a very young age, Nietzsche struggled with his health. He had bouts of being bedridden with migraines and struggled with a sickly tummy. Bug-munching Redditors like to use this to prove that everything Nietzsche wrote was cope. They like to sneer at how the prophet of the Ubermensch had a sore tummy from time to time. But the truth is, Nietzsche never claimed to be a superhero himself. Instead, he was just like us. He was human, all too human. And his struggles with his health reflect a problem we see all across our society today. All of us are degenerates. I don't think I know a single person who didn't have an autoimmune disease when they were growing up. I myself had eczema, these chronic, terrible skin rashes on my legs that I just couldn't get rid of. I know so many people who had asthma, and many more who have less obvious health problems such as depression or period pains. The devil's deal about modern life is that we can have an abundance of food, but all of it poisons us. And this great poisoning has been going on for centuries because it is a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. As the quantity of food we need to produce expands, the quality drops dramatically. And so even back in Nietzsche's day, he was having trouble with these types of problems. There was something pernicious in the German cuisine that was putting him at risk of transforming into a Redditor. And so he had to try overcome this situation, just like all of us do. We who are so based, we who carry sticks of butter to restaurants and force them to cook with it. We who refuse to handle receipts in fear of the BPAs. We who have announced guerrilla war on vegetable oils. We who publicly burn cookbooks that include bug recipes. We who are red-pilling the masses on the malevolence of big soy. We who think in anguish about how much more manly our high testosterone grandfathers were. We are like Nietzsche in that we are born into a hell world that makes us sick. And it is our sole responsibility to stand up and overcome that sickness. So Nietzsche was like many of us moderns, plagued by autoimmune diseases, betrayed by doctors, 
haunted by anxiety, but he forced himself to push through regardless. He would not become a bug man. And so the first lie that you were told is that his health made him weak, which is the largest lie of all, because despite his terrible health, he achieved incredible things. Despite this bad health, Nietzsche was not a failure, because he was not a bitch. He excelled in his academics, as you would expect, but hidden from you most of all is the fact that he was a very good soldier. Nietzsche signed up to be part of one of the Prussian army's artillery divisions. He was regarded as one of the finest riders among his fellow recruits, and his officers predicted that he would soon reach the rank of captain. Because he was so talented, they put him on one of the most difficult riding horses, and ironically, like Superman, he fell off and had a serious injury. So he had to go back to his studies with his military dreams quashed. But famously, he got offered the position of tenured professor at the University of Basel at the young age of 24. Still to this day, this is a record. Nietzsche was sickly. Nietzsche had problems. Nietzsche was not perfect, but he did not let any of this stop him. He made something of himself. So while all this drama and confusion was going on, he began to settle into his identity as a man of letters, a great poet, a philosopher. Now the danger here is that he would become a nerd. But luckily, Nietzsche was no book-coping, reddit-tier, bug-munching, I-fucking-love-science dork. He was a bit of a bad boy. He joined this fraternity called the Wild Click. And what these guys used to do is go out drinking and smoking the whole time. Watch yourself, we got a badass in the room. And I don't know, you know, this is just me speculating, but I have a feeling that he probably lost his incel dumb once or twice during this period. And beyond that, we have to give him credit because he networked his way into the inner circles of one of his favorite musicians, Richard Wagner. Imagine if you could talk your way into the social circles of one of your favorite musicians. Wagner, of course, quite liked him, although he gave Nietzsche quite a hard time. Nietzsche once played some of his own music for him and Wagner laughed at it and called it cute. And he used to tease Nietzsche by suggesting that his chronic headaches were caused by chronic masturbation. Now that he was in these circles and he was tenured as a professor, he was set up for success. A creative man within the high society of German culture. In 1872, he released his first book where he conceptualized the Dionysian and Apollonian forces within art, which he called the birth of tragedy. Now, this was a very speculative work. It wasn't very scientific. He was really coloring outside the lines with this. So most of his fellow German professors called it junk. This left Nietzsche blackpilled. And this contributed, along with many other things, to his growing anger towards German culture. You see, at the time, that war he fought in was the Franco-Prussian War, where the Germans defeated France and were beginning to establish themselves as the big dogs in Europe. Now, all great political projects usually come with supporting thinkers. And for this new German empire that Nietzsche lived in, the foundational intellectual was Schopenhauer, and the foundational artist was Wagner. And this irked him a lot. He did not like this. Because Schopenhauer was a genius, a fascinating writer, but a horrifically black-pilled pessimist. Nietzsche saw in his philosophy a philosophy of death. Then in 1878, he wrote a book called Human All Too Human. And this was a big deal in many different ways. First, it was a rebellion against Schopenhauerian pessimism and Wagner calling him a coomer. Second, it was the first book of his 10 years of productivity before he went insane. It was the beginning of a peak and the beginning of the end. And lastly, after this book was published, his health began to spiral out of control again. The migraines came back. He became short-sighted to the point of blindness. He could no longer work, and so his university cut him a deal. One decade after he became professor, they set him free. They gave him a pension and allowed him all the time he needed to go fix his health. And this began Nietzsche's prophetic wandering period. Ten years where he traveled around the mountains of Europe, creating a set of writings so original, so vital, that they would transform the consciousness of Western man for all of time. But ultimately, this gift would cost him his life. 
At this point, Nietzsche became one of the first digital nomads. He began traveling around like a modern millennial Airbnb hopping. It was as if he was running a Twitter account or a computer programmer so he could work from wherever he went. And so he chose whatever cities best suited his metabolism for each season. The winters in Italy, the summers in Switzerland. You see these types of characters biohacking, doing jujitsu, hiking all the time. Well, this is precisely what happened to Nietzsche. Nietzsche became a hike chad. Here's a description of his daily routine. With Spartan rigor, which never ceased to amaze his landlord grocer, Nietzsche would get up every morning when the faintly dawning sky was still grey, and after washing himself with cold water from the pitcher and china basin in his bedroom and drinking some warm milk, he would, when not felled by headaches and vomiting, work uninterrupted until 11 in the morning. He then went for a brisk two-hour walk through the nearby forest or along the edge of the lake. He would stop from time to time to jot down his latest thoughts in his notebook that he always carried with him. He would return late for lunch so that he didn't get caught up in the midday rush. And he would have a meal usually consisting of a steak and an unbelievable amount of fruit, according to the hotel manager, who also thought that that was the cause of his sore tummy. After lunch, he would get up and go again on a monstrous hike, not returning until 4 or 5 p.m. He would immediately get to work, organizing all his thoughts from the day, sustaining himself on honey, fruit, and pots of tea, until around 11 p.m., all tuckered out, he would put out his candle and go to sleep. And this foundational routine that you just heard, this is what wrote some of the greatest works in Western literature. The man trusted no thoughts that happened to him inside, so he made sure that he was outside hiking all day, allowing the gods to speak to him out in the high mountain air, where he summoned his health so he could express a new vision for Western man's soul. How does an incel die of syphilis? As his health came back into gear, he became more social. He began to meet various people. And one of these was a woman, and her name was Lou Salome. Now, Mrs. Salome was a little bit like the girl from the Big Bang Theory. She hung out with all the nerds. Nietzsche got obsessed with her in his day, and Sigmund Freud also found her to be a good muse. Now, the reason why Nietzsche met her is because of a bit of a love triangle. So bear with me here for a second. Lou's mum brought her to Rome when she was 21. There, she met Nietzsche's friend Paul Ray, and Paul fell in love with her. So he proposed to her, but she friend-zoned him. Paul, then firmly cucked, suggested that they create an academic commune together and live as brother and sister. Creepy male feminist vibes going on there. And to top this off, he suggests that they invite Nietzsche to stay with them. So he writes Nietzsche a letter, and Nietzsche says, all right, I'm down, and shows up. And then he falls in love with Lou. Now apparently Nietzsche turned around and told his friend Paul to ask Lou to marry Nietzsche which might be some of the worst game I've ever heard in my life. No wonder he was an incel. So Paul proposes to Lou for Nietzsche, and Lou, of course, rejects him. And she says she only sees Nietzsche as a friend. So now these two plonkers are stuck being beta orbiters to this girl. So now these three, alongside Lou's mother, begin wandering around to look for an abandoned monastery to build this commune they're planning. Nietzsche finally gets the chance to pull Lou aside on a big long walk, and he proposes to her himself, and she rejects him again. At this point, Nietzsche's sister Elizabeth gets word of what was going on, hears that her brother is turning into a simp, and so starts to get involved, trying to break up the whole affair by accusing Nietzsche of being naive and that Lou Salome is a hoe. This began to sour the dynamic. Paul and Ray conspired to ditch Nietzsche. So they leave together and it crushes Nietzsche. He spirals into depression. Wondering, has he just been betrayed by the pair? He begins to hate his sister for getting involved. And I know a lot of people don't like Nietzsche's sister, but I think she did a good job snapping him out of this one. You see, Paul Ray kept on simping for Lou all throughout the rest of his life, and he constantly proposed to her, and she kept on rejecting him. She kept friend-zoning him, and eventually he snapped. He went to the place where she had most recently rejected his marriage proposal, and he killed himself. And though Nietzsche escaped this, he did not escape it unscathed. He was devastated, deeply scarred. And just like any guy who goes through a breakup, his pain 
can be the source of creativity, a way to reinvent yourself. And so after this breakup, Nietzsche sank down into depression, but he overcame this depression. And he did so with style, because the next thing he wrote was, Thus spoke Zarathustra. Friedrich Nietzsche was now alone, his heart broken from unrequited love, his books failing to sell, and his health, exacerbated by his depression, began spiralling once again. And in this darkness he faced something that we all face. The private struggle with pain. Nobody shares our experience of pain. We deal with pain all alone. We suffer in silence by ourselves. And it was in this heavy pain that Nietzsche developed his wisdom. His greatest educator became pain. He saw what life was. Life is suffering. All the major religions say so. To live is to suffer. And he realized that the struggle we have is finding a reason as to why we should continue suffering. At this low point, why would Nietzsche not take out a gun and end his life? Schopenhauer's bewitching negativity whispered in the back of his mind. Life is crooked and evil. Our passions bewitch us to engage with life. Our urges make us chase after women, not for our own pleasure, but so we can be exploited. Life is a deceiver. Our hunger, our lust, our desire to be loved, a desire to be a part of something. All these instincts and passions are the tools that nature uses to turn us into puppets at the end of her puppet strings. And it has no meaning. And it has no purpose. It has no noble goal. Look out into the jungle. Look at the agony and pain that echoes to the animal world. This is not good. There is no God saving the innocent, only psychotic nature manipulating us, tricking us into playing along. It is only our self-deception and our hopes and our dreams that stop us seeing what this world really is. And our religion is an elaborate rationalization that we tell ourselves. A story about a made-up world called heaven, where none of the laws of nature apply, where pain does not exist and instead it is only pleasure. A lie that helps us survive. And so Nietzsche sat there in his pain and had to entertain these thoughts, like we all do. And he had to ask himself, what was he going to fight for? God had died for him. He could not find solace in the story of religion. He was too modern and felt like a lie to him. What opened up beneath him was the abyss of pessimism, the dark whispers of life having no meaning of pain being pointless, which leaves you with only one action. To deny your life, to end your life, to accept that life is evil, life is wrong, life is a trick. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or Buddhist or atheist or pessimistic. We can all agree that life is a meat grinder of pain. It is a torture chamber and we have been drugged by the demiurge as he tortures us. And all our struggles are doing nothing but feeding his psychotic appetites. Nietzsche found himself in the dark hole of nihilism. In that place where even Jesus Christ found himself. When he called up to heaven, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And in this moment, Nietzsche's struggle became clear. Either he would have to accept the pessimistic truth about reality and blow his brains out. Or he would have to lie to himself and say he believes in Christianity, say he believes in God, and say he believes in heaven. But there was one other path. Deep inside of himself there was a feeling, a feeling that he had had for decades, a whisper that he saw in dreams, a hint of something that he discovered in the ancients, the old stories of the past, something that he was carrying, something that made him believe, something that he was trying to give birth to, Something that held an answer to this terrible anguish and pain. And this something exploded out of him as Zarathustra. Zarathustra affirmed life. Zarathustra believed in a future. Zarathustra embraced the pain. 
Zarathustra found a meaning to fight for. That it was not a lie, that was a truth. That was an embrace of the world as it is. Zarathustra was an endless lightning bolt of positivity, of vitality, of hope, of potential. In Zarathustra, Nietzsche could fight again. He overcame nihilism. He overcame delusion. He overcame pessimism. He justified pain. He fell back in love with the world. Most importantly, he fell in love with life. Because he loved life, he had a reason to fight for his health. Because he loved life and he loved the world, he had a reason to believe in the future. After his great breakup, Nietzsche overcame himself and finally transformed. He became a yes-sayer to life. Or in his own words, he said, My formula for greatness within a man is amor fati. Love your destiny. So once this psychological transformation happened inside of Nietzsche, he went on to write Thus Spoke Zarathustra in 10 days. And it was completely saturated with this affirmative, aggressive, vital, bombastic energy. A new energy. A joyful energy. I hear you say that life is hard. It is heavy and painful. I see you slumped over with your head in your hands in resignation. But I am here to tell you that your heart is not weak. It is plump and it is juicy, and it beats and fights through the pain so it can be filled with love. What did Nietzsche mean by this? What did Zarathustra mean by this? Of course, what happened with Nietzsche is he went through depression. He was a sickly man in many ways. And he did something that I think is defining from the guy, because an awful lot of people like to say that Nietzsche was just a sick, weirdo, degenerate, all these types of things. He was a failure. You shouldn't listen to him because all these types of things. Yes, I'm here constantly talking about this German incel for a very specific reason, because I think in the center of his life is a bit of heroism. He fought through pain. He fought through suffering he fought through struggle to create something great and what happened after this breakup with this Lou Simone where you know you know maybe I shouldn't say breakup we say this unrequited love with Mrs. Lou Simone and uh, Salome he went and he, he had to beat his mind he had to put his mind into shape and make something of himself and eventually what happened is he he wrote Zarathustra and he had this stretch of 10 years of creativity and then he fell ill and then had a mental breakdown and, you know, basically died. And that was basically the end of him, you know. And it's always interesting to look at someone who's achieved something like this. Because those 10 years after this, after he wrote Zarathustra, those 10 years were an apex of Western civilization. They were an apex of, um, you know, the European literary tradition. It was an incredible achievement what he pulled off. He really contributed and left a legacy to change the world. And it was 10 years that he pulled this off. It was just that little snippet was the golden era for him. And all the rest of his life was painful. All the rest of his life was struggles in many ways. He was just the whole way throughout his 20s and 30s. He was struggling with metabolism problems and health problems. He was getting rejected by girls and stuff like this. He was fucking up. And still he managed to push through. And push through the suffering. And not be defined by his weakness. And not be defined by his suffering. And he managed to craft for himself something that was beyond himself. He has this beautiful statement in um, Twilight of the Idols where he says that through art man overcomes himself and creates perfection which then he can use to rejoice over himself. Now what, do, what does he mean by this? You are a broken fallen being. You are human all too human. You are decrepit, ugly, petty, mean. You lie to yourself. You're sick. You've got all these types of problems. You're going to die one day. You're lazy. You're addicted to all sorts of vices. You're going to, you know, touch yourself later. You're going to eat shitty food at some point in the future. You're not perfect. But there's something about you that can create things that are perfect. Like Michelangelo pooped like everybody else. Michelangelo farted, he sneezed, he had all these disgusting, ugly, human all to human facts about himself. But at one point in his life, he crafted out of marble, out of stone, he crafted the statue of David. And he showed man, he showed all of us, an image of a moment in time that was perfect, a, a, an image of the perfect body, of humanity at its apex, at its peak. And it, he achieved a perfection. 
And he even said when he was doing this, it felt like he was releasing an angel, a god, a divine being, in the old Greco-Roman style. And what was happening when he was chiseling away this form and revealing this is he became perfect. He created perfection at one point. He found inside of himself a little piece of himself that was able to touch God, that was able to contribute towards God's project. And he manifested. And all the pooping and all the sneezing and all the sicknesses and all the bad days and the depression, he went through all of those and managed to manifest this one thing that justified it, that proved that he is capable of something that is worthy of all that pain. And he made Michelangelo's statue. And this is so important to understand. Because no matter how... You don't hear about Michelangelo's depression. You don't hear about stuff like that. His sadness, his bad days, his breakups and all this type of stuff. Because they don't actually matter. It was his ability to overcome that and do something magnificent that actually matters. That shows us what we are. It's far beyond him as an individual. And so when he creates this and he reveals... David to himself, King David to himself for the first time. And he looks at it and he says, I just made this. He's looking at perfection. He's looking at God looking down upon him. God that came out of him and was manifest in the world. He was a vessel to create an angel. An angel was born through him, just like he was born through his mother. An angel was born through him and he's made something amazing. And it stands there as something that's perfect. And he can rejoice with it and say that, that's actually what I am. Or, at the very least, I'm connected to this. And it's almost like I've been put down in this fallen body of mine, but I can still reach up towards this type of beauty and this type of magnificence. And, we, like, we have to be able to grip on this feeling better because the culture that we have built around ourselves is full of this weakness and this deceptive lying where we say to ourselves that, Suffering is something that we need to get rid of. Suffering is bad. Suffering is a signal of an issue of some sort. Suffering is the antithesis to comfort and equality and fairness. And we need to build a society that eradicates suffering. You hear this all the time. And that itself is almost anti-artistic. It's anti-perfection. It's anti-God. It's anti-life. It's anti-the divinity. Michelangelo can't create the statue of David in a, a culture that believed in equality and fairness and justice and suffering. It can't, it can't do that type of thing. Because anything that approaches the world trying to enhance comfort is doing that at the expense of excellence. It's always going to be like that. It's just one of these sad paradoxes of life. It's not even that sad when you think about it because even if you give everybody all the comforts and the excellence they want in the world, they're still going to suffer just as much. They're going to, you're going to suffer no matter what. You know, look at our society. You have all the painkillers you want. You have all the food you want. All the blankets. All the feathery blankets you want. Tinder. You can have a chick whenever you want. You can just mail order her in. But you're not happy. You're more depressed. You're on more painkillers and more, more depression pills because of how shit things are. Because of how hard life is. Because no matter how much you try to placate the suffering, it just amplifies. It just spirals out of control. Your mind creates a new one. Because you're built... To fight. You're built to experience. You're built to pursue something higher. You're built, your heart is built to experience pain and beat through it so that one day it can be filled with love. That's what it's all about. And this is destroying the West at the moment. And it's destroying the West in many different ways. But one of the premier ones is that there's no foundation for excellent people like Michelangelo to create the Statue of David. There's no place that we can sit down and say, all right, where do we go to make something magnificent? You can't do that. Look at the way like art is going right now, where you literally can't even make art anymore because it has to follow along with some type of ideology, some type of nonsense, some type of, of thing. It's, it's, it's poisonous. It's toxic. And this is what is going on with our society. We're living through an era of nihilism where people, where the world, where our culture cannot embrace things that are higher, things that are glorious, things that are beautiful. Because we don't believe in the world. We don't believe in life. We don't believe in ourselves. We think nothing has any meaning. We think there's nothing to fight for. And the only worthy, justifiable goal is to try to escape suffering, like what Schopenhower, Buddhism, and Christianity say. The, 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 th the tonics of the world that, that deaden you and make you run away from life. And Nietzsche, in his own life, went through this process. He went through that phase where he was burdened with suffering. He had all these diseases. He had all these festering abscesses, these problems with blindness and stuff like this. He had all that stuff happen to him. And he was given the ghost, the demon of nihilism showed up in his lap and said, you can embrace escapism here. You can em embrace nihilism. You can embrace death. And instead, he fought against that. Despite himself, he bullied back against that and did not become a modern 
you know, a modern, basically, who sits around and medicates themselves into the abyss and doesn't feel anything anymore and, and copes and seeds and becomes unhealthy and sick. Instead, he went mountain climbing. He went and trying to figure out his diet by eating loads of fruit and meat. He became a Paul Saladino fan, these types of things. And this transformed him absolutely and gave him one brief opportunity for 10 years to create something beautiful, to create something that stands out as ascendant, to, to prove that there's part of his soul that is worthy of eternal life. And he achieved it. He pulled it off. Like, he's, he's going to live forever. He's going to have a legacy until the end of time. Because, well, until the end of, you know, until the next Atlantean reset civilization comes along and a flood happens in the third time or whatever it is. And in order for him to do that, he had to fight against his suffering. And he fell back down into his suffering and became diseased and decrepit and died and it was embarrassing and ugly. And he became human all too human again, as we all do. But for that brief moment, he became perfect. He achieved something that is glorious, just like Michelangelo. Just like any great artist, just like any great creator, Alexander the Great is the exact same thing. Alexander the Great died in bed, coughing his lungs up. I'm sure he had many opportunities or many moments in his life where he fucked up. He killed some of his friends at points. He had true tantrums. I'm sure he sneezed and he had snots and did all these types of problems. But he created something that was magnificent for this one point. And this high point that Nietzsche created was wrapped up within it, this ideology, this mindset, this attitude towards the world that is transformative, subversive to the problems that we are going through. In fact, it's, it's almost like explaining at the same time as being the example of what we need to do in the West in order to escape the problem that we have. And you can obviously take it for yourself as an individual, but it's, 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 it's a, a diagnosis for the whole of the West. We're in this situation where we've lost our religion and we've entered into this nihilistic period this period where comfort and pleasure and delusion and lies and pettiness and equality have all become superordinate and for that reason many of the creative geniuses that we have are becoming more destroyed and they can't express themselves properly and this is finally reaching its apex point in the modern world and our way through this is to learn how to overcome nihilism. This is what Nietzsche was constantly talking about. How do we overcome nihilism? Because people would say stuff like Nietzsche's a nihilist. He was someone who's trying to teach us how to overcome nihilism, overcome the bleakness. He was saying that there will be a point in all of our lives where we will be confronted with suffering and pain and loss and death and existential pain and struggle, like he was when he lay down there blind and sick. And Christianity is no longer going to have the pregnant strength to comfort us. And this is a very big problem. Because when you're, gonna, when you're lying on your deathbed and asking yourself, I'm going to die, it's easy now to be a, you know, a libtard atheist like Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris, that dork or something like this. But it's not so easy when you're sitting down there and you're facing the, or you're out in the open ocean. There's no atheists out in the open ocean. It's not so easy when you're sitting there and you're bleeding out and you're thinking to yourself, all right, what am I? Oh, well, I'm a, I'm a hardcore, well, yeah, you know, Yahweh, sorry, you're, you're irrational, you know, you're a, you're a tyrant and all this type of stuff. In those moments, your, your soul will want, will want to just hedge its bets, will want to just default back to Christianity and be like, whoa, baby, let's take it easy. I'm not, you know, a meaningless atom just floating through this universe. And the, the problem that we have in our world is we're moving towards a new way of seeing the world, so people suggest. And as we go deeper into this nihilism, it's shearing apart everything that we are and everything that we're made up of. It's changing the way that we operate and act in the world. And it's not providing for us any answers. It's sort of us just simply cascading into death and falling apart and seeing our society crumble around us. And Nietzsche had been through all of that stuff himself. He tried to, I, I'd imagine, not try to delude himself when he's dealing with his pain and try to confront and embrace the pain and push through towards excellence no matter what. And this led to him conquering all these phases that we seem to be going through in our civilization. Our phase currently now is this atheistic, soulless nihilism. And this is the sort of deep, dark night of the soul, the, the most abysmal part where everything is just crumbling and what we are is just completely falling apart. And what comes after that is the final push through where the strong within us, the thing that is capable of perfection within us, the, the thing that is capable of reaching towards what is higher, finally gets its heartbeat, its thrust, where it can push through and decide, I'm not going to be defined by death, I'm not going to be defined by depression, I'm not going to be defined by my pain, I'm not going to be defined by my suffering, I'm going to overcome this and define myself based on what I can create, define myself on a new destiny, I'm going to launch myself into the future and believe in something and become something. 
And this is what he achieved. This is what he did in his life. And it's, you know, not the most magnificent thing ever. It's not the most romantic thing ever. But he pulled this off. Um, he made this philosophy, this way of seeing the world that is pregnant with that idea alone. This is really, I think, the most important thing. And in the West, in man, in us, you see this. I look at, I talk to millennials and Zoomers and boomers, and nobody has that ambition. Nobody has that heart. Nobody has that grandeur inside of themselves. Nobody has that belief. In the West, it's so bad that the Western people don't even believe in themselves. They don't even believe in who they are. They hate themselves. They want to destroy their society. There's some of them, some Westerners that believe that the, maybe there's a good goal where they can feed the world or something like this or create reform societies and make them all equal and that's them attempting to do something somewhat creative but of course it's a bit spineless it's a bit spiritless it's not far enough it's still trapped within the paradigm of the death cult of equality it's not gone to that next paradigm where you're saying well what would we have to do to create michelangelo there can only be one michelangelo there can only be one grand perf perfection Michelangelo wasn't concerned about, you know, feeding the world or making soy protein or something like this. It's like, you know, feeding everybody bugs so nobody goes, nobody goes hungry as Mr. You know, as Mr. What's his name talks about the whole time. And this is the big issue because that's what we need to be asking ourselves. Like, what are we pushing through to create a culture that manifests characters like Leonardo or Michelangelo? Grand high points, grand glorious moments where we can produce something that is justifying of all our struggling. When we can look at it and say that is beautiful and that makes all the pain and struggling and starvation and problems that I went through worth it. That's what gives me dignity. Feeding me bug protein may fill my stomach up, but it will not give me dignity. It will not make me believe that my empty stomach was worth it. This is the big problem. This is what people cannot see. Because people have lost touch with life. They've lost touch with suffering. This is another thing as well. We don't actually suffer that much. And we want to eradicate suffering and struggle and pain. But we have no contact with it. Anybody who gets in contact with suffering knows that suffering is good. Suffering is helpful. Suffering actually gives everything meaning in a way. Suffering, if you have the mind that di can digest it properly, transforms you into somebody who understands that you have to suffer for something. It makes you want to seek out things that are amazing and great and grand and beautiful. This is really what's going on. I've had many struggles that broke the fucking arm recently and it's extremely painful. And every time I'm sitting in that pain, it's amazing how much it destroys so many delusions inside of my mind and makes me reconnect with the world and reprioritize my system of values. I have a trans valuation of values every time I have a serious injury, you know? It happens in my life. And what's happened in the West, an awful lot of people get very, very pessimistic about this stuff, maybe the guys who like get what's going on, they get blackpilled, but they don't understand that even this injury that's happening to the West right now is actually having this very healthy effect on us. This young millennial generation who's waking up to all this stuff. We are starting to suffer very seriously and our society is getting destroyed and our people are getting exploited and oppressed and destroyed and our artists are getting crushed and our warriors are delusional. They don't even know what they're fighting for. But all this stuff is terrible. But it's waking many of us up. It's, a, it's forcing us to reprioritize and reevaluate our value systems and what we stand for and what we believe in. And it's going to pressure us to transform into something better that will have a better direction that we can go for it's going to be hard because we're going to have to fight for it we're also going to have to prove that we have the fight in us and that we actually care and that we're willing to make the sacrifices necessary to achieve something but if we do this you see the premises that will lead towards high civilization greatness beauty exceptionalness things that actually matter things that give dignity to people a high art a high cultural period because as i said many of the the great aspirations the well-meaning intentions of many people nowadays who want to do things like they talk about climate change they talk about all these type of things they they want they want to aim for these things because these are actually the sort of creative ambitious people but the big idea is the effective altruism of this world are not good enough they're not they're not transvaluated ideas they're they're nihilistic ideals climate change effective altruism saving the world all these type of things these things are just just soulless they just don't have that in them whereas all of these things such as making the world a better place healing nature in, in, engorging with nature marrying with nature we can actually do that stuff it's just that it's not going to happen in the terms that we wanted to happen
for us to align with the world and nature it's going to force us to align with her values and that's going to be absolutely destructive to the entire paradigm that we intellectually operate on right now so most people who are operating in these things they're not honest they're pursuing a very human agenda they're hu pursuing a very arrogant man agenda you know mankind's agenda that he doesn't want to align with the true nature of nature and what nature actually cares about and what nature wants what the world wants to see the world wants to see an ubermensch a superman uh, a symbol of excellence uh, no matter what expense now we are in this struggle against this nihilistic feeling like this is what's happening it's the mediocrity the cowardness the sheepishness the fear of suffering within man the love of comfort within man that pettiness that unwillingness to face the pain that's our great enemy and of course it can start with yourself but you simply pushing yourself onto the world and finding suffering and embracing that suffering and proving yourself excellent despite this that's the place that it can begin and the more that we begin to responsibly take that into our hands and push forward the further we will get along the road towards seeing the culture around us transform and become more dignifying and start to see beautiful things begin to pop out of the culture and great achievements begin to happen this is Nietzsche's prophecy this is Nietzsche's prognosis his diagnosis his prescription for us making it through nihilism because we are now entering into or maybe even quite deep into the dark period of nihilism that comes that's going to be hard before this reawakening this rebirth this re-energizing that is coming for our world and the west and it is coming and Nietzsche has seen it before it may not even happen in our generation but when it happens you will know and you need to be the start now, one of Nietzsche's main worries about the future of the West was the problem of education. He said that he needs a hundred well-placed men in order to reform the education system because it was going to turn into this abysmal, delusional, cope world that we see today. And you hear an awful lot of people talk about this. They say, for example, that the Jordan Peterson says that the universities are full of these professors who are promulgating all these negative ideas about the world this nihilism about the world and this is really what's going on you can imagine that they're like the you know, depressed brain cells making the rest of the body depressed and the brain just can't get rid of them can't oust them because they're stuck inside a certain part of the mind which is the institutions they're inside the organ you know they're like a parasite and the reason why this is relevant to us is because if you got good people in there if you got the right people in there educating the youth you would see a generation of young people come out who would be healthy and strong. We wouldn't be caught up in this mess where we're self-reflective and trying to understand ourselves and self-hating ourselves and destroying ourselves. Instead, you would have generations of people pump out who have self-confidence. They are well-trained and skillful. They're not stuck in silly hesitation that doesn't bring them anywhere. They're not self-defeating. They're not, you know, chipping at their own heels. Instead, they would be productive and creative and they'd be making culture and pushing their version of reality upon the world. And it would be an accurate and life-affirming and empowering reality. Reality. And this is how you would see great artists find a place of success in the world and all this type of stuff. Now, this has not happened because the education system has gone the wrong direction. And one of the premier problems is its lack of skill training. The education system does not transform you into somebody who's skilled and capable of doing what you need to do. I noticed this with myself. I was in the education system and... I sat down in all the classes in college. I remember when I went into it and I was a young man and I wanted to become talented. I wanted to become capable. I wanted to be able to articulate the image inside of my mind. I wanted to be able to build things in the real world so people treated me with respect and status, so people cared about me, so people could see me. I wanted to be able to create for myself something so that I could gain success in this world. I wanted to release my imagination, as I say. And going to university, I thought they would do that. You know, they're going to set me on the path for a career. And I wanted to be a creator. I wanted to be an artist or a musician or a writer or a speaker. Any of these things. I was looking for something like this. And I was expecting them to train me in this stuff. And I show up in the university system. And I'm like, hey, how are you doing? So you're going to teach me? And they sit me down on day one. And they hand me the communist manifesto. Well, actually, they made me buy the communist manifesto. Funny how that works, isn't it? They made me buy the communist manifesto. I, I thought they would, they, they would give it out for free, surely. And they made me uh, read all these types of things. And th then I went through critical theory, which is the looking at the Western canon, the Western Western canon, and critiquing how it is phallogocentric and full of, you know, white men who are pushing their ideology upon the world. So they claim. And I went to gender theory and all this type of stuff. And I sat through all this. And the whole part of my college experience was having information shoved into my head and all these weird new perspectives shoved into my head that I embraced quite open-mindedly because I'm thinking to myself, well, these are interesting new perspectives. If I'm to be a creative thinker, I guess I got to start to see things outside of the box a little bit, you know? 
and I would go along with this for a while and eventually the bullshit marker started to go off in my head something started to nag in the back of my mind and I started to say to myself wait a second wait a second one though I'm not learning anything I'm not getting better at, at speaking I'm not getting better at writing I'm not getting better at singing I'm not getting better at creating I'm not getting better at organizing businesses I'm not getting any skills I'm not getting better at fighting any of these things. No, there's no skills that I'm gaining that is making me a, a higher quality character in my video game of life. This isn't good. This isn't right. Instead, all that was happening is I was getting information shoved into my brain. I was getting brainwashed is what I actually started to realize. And I don't know, no, that sounds inflammatory perhaps, but this is the truth. I was getting psyoped into being turned into a bug man, into a soy boy. And I didn't realize it back then. In fact, this was very instinctive for me. And when I was younger, I just sort of felt that I needed skills and information was not going to get me what I wanted. And so what I started to do was start to go and literally find other people in the city and start to train with them. And I began to stop going to college classes. I'd spend more time in the gym lifting weights and stuff like this. And then eventually I just dropped out of the whole endeavor altogether. I said, no, I'm not participating in this because this is trying to inform me instead of trying to shape me. It's trying to drill information into my head instead of produce out of me capacities and skills. And I knew I needed skills. If I wanted to build things and make things in the world and become a creator, I needed skills. Now, this actually served me very well in my life going forward because I didn't realize it again at the time. But going out and pursuing skills empowered me to be able to build things for myself. I could create assets out of nothing. I became creative in many different ways. I could sit down. I organized the teaching business for myself, teaching English at one point. And I was very good at just doing many of the natural things within it. A lot of people would get anxiety when it comes to you know organizing or running some type of operation for themselves. But it was quite easy for me to do because I could speak. I was charismatic. I could do public speaking. I understood how to leverage um, telling narratives and stories stories, understood how to work with people because I spent many years dealing with all the, these different types of people and learning all the skills that are necessary for this. I actually could do this type of stuff and this allowed me to get my own money for the first time without a job. And then I go and I start doing YouTube, it's the same thing. I can start to build for myself this asset and start to speak to people without any, um, I don't know, weird professor in between corralling what my words are supposed to mean and all this type of stuff. And I find that I've developed all these skills that allow me to build things for myself. I can even create art in this channel like this beautiful thing and at the start of this and I have the skills necessary to do this. I've been trained in all the capacities that are necessary for something like this. And I start to realize that that instinctive choice I made to say, screw you to the education system was one of the best choices in my life. Again, like all great choices, it was an instinctive one. It was my gut telling me to do this. And I said, no, I don't, I don't want to participate in that. I drop out. I put a huge amount of risk on my plate and go and I try to become better and try to learn how to build things for myself. And it works. It, it, I figure it out in that type of way. And it basically sets me up for freedom. I'm now in a position where I can build an asset for myself, which sets me financially free. I can you know, lose everything tomorrow and I can just build it up all again because I'm full of all these skills that are able to do this. I now know how to build a lot, an awful lot of different types of assets. I, you know, I can sit down there. We started TikTok there the last while. I know Chinese spyware, like I get it. Yeah. But we started and said, right, well, let's try build with this and see what's going on. This is where there's this big opportunity. And I just ripped my one up to 30,000 followers there again. And I can write, you know, I can sit down. I could say, all right, maybe you start going on Twitter and starting to write on Twitter now because Mr. Musk is over there and that's starting to build up again. I'm able to run operations with businesses. I'm able to talk with people. I'm able to work with people. I'm able to fight. I'm training to, how to do all this. Maybe I'll start some YouTube boxing, boxing of some sort. I've got this ability to learn very fast and I've got this vast array of skills that now compound with all of these type of things because of this mental attitude and this approach. And I've thought about this quite a lot and I said to myself, you know, this is how the education system should be built. This is the construction of an education system that would actually be empowering to people in the way that they always say it is instead of something that's a brainwashing camp. This is the type of thing that you would need. And this has got me thinking about what I would like to build for you. So for a long time, I've been running my program and I've been constantly getting people in and I've been thinking to myself, how can I make these people better? How can I make them transform? What can I give them? What do I have that they need? And routinely, I come back to the question of competence, the question of skill, the question of capacity to create, the question of the ability to do something well, you know, to make the video at the start of this, the short two minute animation, you know, 
this is all about studying the musicality of the punchlines, understanding color theory, understanding how to organize and arrange assets, understanding how to script out a story, understanding how to speak. Oh, like I have to learn to speak. We've got my musical skills, my editors. They've got all these things that they know and visual narratives, questioning how to sequence all this stuff out, how to use the various pieces of technology that are necessary. Like it's a very vast array of skills that are required in order to make something small like that to do any almost anything like that requires skill but the thing is is that when you have that type of skill and you can build things like this and you can put them out into the world you can create nice videos that get people's attention and build yourself a brand and a presence or maybe you can do it for somebody else and build yourself some type of business or maybe you can speak so that you can go into a, an office of people and lead a team to build something like this these types of skills are the things that change your life because this allows you to get more wealth to get more money makes you be able to enact your will upon the world it will get you respect with people it leads to incredibly important outcomes it makes you self-respect yourself an awful lot more it gives you something productive that you can do with your time and this is the thing that ends up actually transforming people you know and when i say transform it moves them from that place of say being depressed and feeling disempowered and looking at the world around you mean like they're all nihilists they're all last men out there what am i going to do with myself into a position of you know what, I can take control of this situation and I can take myself to the highest level and I can become I can become a beast, you know. I can actually extract out of this crazy world success for myself. I can start to take advantage of this chaos, even though we're in maybe the decline of the West. I can still come out a winner, just like the Goths came out a winner when Rome was falling. I'm sure all the Romans were black-pilled, but the Goths, because they were competent supreme warriors, were able to come out of it as the people who had a legacy for the future. You have to be that person, and you can't be that person just because you know, just because you think, just because you sit around, you read Nietzsche and you have some notions about how the world is. Oh, I've, I'm the man with knowledge. I understand what's going on. Your knowledge means nothing. Amateurs love information that they can gather and tell professionals, successful people. Winners love information that they can gather from acting things that they can do. They learn through action and learn through doing. They want to seize procedures that help them en enact themselves upon the world. That's what you should be looking for. So consistently, I've noticed this, that when somebody comes in and I am working with them, I'm always seeing this breaking down of their, their, their ineffective habits of pursuing knowledge or getting stuck in theory selling. There's nothing wrong with theory, but it has to be balanced with practice and instead replacing it with exact procedures that are going to empower them to become better in the world. And so, of course, I picked up loads of procedures throughout my life in order to build a channel like this, in order to speak, in order to do all sorts of things. I need procedures. I need skills. I need talents. I need things. These are the things that I had to drop out of fucking college to try find. These are the things that I need to seek. And these are the things that I can teach to you. Now, I won't be able to teach you how to shine shoes. I won't be able to teach you how to run a rocketing engineering project and all this type of stuff. But I'm very good at teaching people things like speech, things like the utilization of information and how to present it so that it is more persuasive, public speaking, speaking and being good on video, building up your personal brand, doing all these type of things. These are skills that I have in abundance and I can show you. So if you would like to learn these, you can join the Boyo program and in there, I'll be able to give you all these procedures and you can learn them. Now, alongside this, you get a crew of Boyos like myself, a load of other guys with this type of attitude that are focused on building assets and using skills that are going to make them more powerful in the world. And you can come in and be in that mastermind in that group of people that are doing this as well. You can go and get brought into a room of people who are focused on this. You imagine you live in a city and everywhere in the city, everyone sucks. Everybody's a soy boy. Where would you go in order to change your life? Well, this is what I do. You know, I go to the local martial arts gym. I go in there and I find the 20 people in the city who are going to beat the living fuck out of themselves and who are in obsessed about being really good at fighting and obsessed about being really talented and learning the specifics and the diligence and need all the virtues that are required to be really good at fighting. And I go to that place. And in that place, all we really talk about is procedures and we punch each other and we get to know each other. But what's so fascinating, and I always see this, is that usually those individuals are some of the best individuals I ever find. Usually they're very open-minded. A lot of them listening to the likes of Joe Rogan because of UFC and all this type of stuff. This leads them to having actually quite an, 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 a lot of diverse opinions about many other things. I've noticed, for example, with jiu-jitsu that you can get particularly intellectual people there, many like chess players, mathematicians, physicists, entrepreneurs and that type of stuff, fighting, boxing, boxing maybe is not not as 
intellectual. I think you lose too many brain cells with this type of stuff. Kickboxing is sort of an in-between. Nonetheless, all those places you find guys with strong virtues, strong values, guys who are not easily cucked by the world order as it is. And the some of the best quality you find there, and it's a great place to meet friends, to meet guys that are just exactly like the crew that you want in your type of life. And it's the same question when it comes to this global city that we live on the, the internet. Where do you go? Out of all the places you could go, you could go to the brunch bar, you could go and you go to the, the lingerie shopping mall and stuff like that, but you're not going to meet the people that are focused on making you better. You're not going to transform by going to these places. You go to, the, to McDonald's in your city over and over again, you might make a couple of friends, you might start to meet people, you might start to get to know the staff, but you're going to end up fat and useless and shit. <laughs> you need to go and find a place where you can constantly show up to that has a crew of people that are focused on building themselves better. Develop your friendships with them. Get to know them. They don't have to be your only friendships. You don't have to only know your fighters, but you need to have this type of access and also come out of it where you see your skills develop. Transform you as an individual with this. So this is what I've been thinking in terms of a modern style of education. This is what the BOYO program is all about. So if you're interested in joining, you can go to the link in the description down below and join right away. Pop yourself in there and we will get you started. We'll audit what's going on. You can send us an introduction we'll look at who you are and then we'll talk about the things that you need to do in order to level yourself up so that is available in the link in the description right down below thank you very much for your time if you enjoyed this please drop us a comment as well and tell us what you thought of the introduction animations and all these types of things stay juicy and i hope you are well bye bye